Thank you, Roger, and uh, thank all of you very much. I appreciate the chance to be with you. As Roger said, as uh, co-chair of the uh, Congressional Internet Caucus, I'm proud to be able to be here for the 10th Annual uh, State of the Net Conference. A decade is, in Internet time is a, is a pretty long period. In fact, it's an eternity, and yet uh, State of the Net has stayed relevant and thought-provoking. And I, too, want to uh, recognize uh, Tim Lorden, who organizes this event uh, on, an, on an annual basis and leads the Net Caucus. He deserves a lot of credit for the successful run that this conference has had. While 10 years is a long time uh, in the life of the Internet, I'd like to take uh, everyone back even a little bit further in time to 1996. That was the year in which I was first elected to Congress. It was the year in which the Mac Arena dominated the music scene. I promised I'm not going to demonstrate. Uh, but it was also the year, the last year, in which the nation's uh, telecommunications laws were updated in a major way. And um, back then, you had to pay for the Internet by the hour. And going online meant tying up your home telephone's line. And once you connected to the Internet on your dial-up modem, there weren't a lot of things to do or places to visit. Because at that time, there were only 100,000 websites. And AOL was the biggest by far. Contrast that to today, where there are 860 million websites. Google and Wikipedia had not been created yet. Blogging and text messages didn't exist either back in 1996. In the mobile world, the biggest technological innovation in 1996 was the introduction of the world's first flip phone. Everybody remembers the flip phones, the Motorola StarTac, which initially sold for $1,000. At that point, more people were still carrying one-way pagers than went online. So despite how much the world, consumers, and the Internet have changed, there are many people who repeatedly try to constrain emerging business models and technologies with last century's regulatory structures. Disruptive startups like Uber, Lyft, Airbnb don't fit neatly into the regulatory boxes of yesterday, but that hasn't stopped intransigent regulators from trying. The sharing economy is real, and it's growing. And while I understand the need to ensure safety and transparency in the marketplace, I wish more government officials shared my optimism about how successful the Internet is at facilitating individual economic empowerment. Here in D.C., there's a policy discussion about how to handle the transition from analog telephone systems to digital all IP networks. The old copper-based networks that were once monopolies remain heavily regulated, and while the Internet is largely unregulated and competitive. Many folks, nonetheless, want to apply archaic telephone regulations to the digital ecosystem, and that is the crux of the policy debate that we're having here in Washington, D.C. And I have to say that I honestly don't understand how anyone believes that laws designed for Ma Bell in the 1930s are appropriate for the Internet today. While there are fundamental goals that need to be preserved, such as universal service and public safety, as policymakers, we need to be open-minded about how to achieve those goals in the future without being bound by the strictures of the past. The Internet ecosystem is a world of entrepreneurship, ingenuity, and innovation. The status quo is a four-letter word in that world, and disruption is the highest virtue. And that's why I'm amazed when so-called advocates for the Internet want to constrain today's marketplace with policy thinking from the last century. There are exceptions, of course, but far too often when you hear someone say, we need regulations to protect the Internet. What they're actually saying is that they don't really trust the Internet entrepreneurs and technologists to create the economic growth and to increase public welfare. The private sector created things like the iPhone, crowdfunding, Wi-Fi, Snapchat, and lolcats. Okay, not, not every innovation is equal. But the government, for its part, has come up with things like Internet kill switch, the ITU, net neutrality, SOPA, PIPA and the NSA. Now, I'm not suggesting that the government is always wrong, and a few, a few of these issues are black and white, but I think the scales should be weighted on the side of the entrepreneurs and the job creators. Do you really need government to step in and help you, or would you really rather the government just get out of your way? Now, I can guess how most of you would probably answer that question, but I believe really there are three things that Congress should be doing to get out of your way and to foster innovation. First, Congress needs to strip away obsolete laws and regulations that simply are no longer needed. For instance, 
before Superstorm Sandy, Verizon was still providing a handful of customers in lower Manhattan with telegraph services for some reason. Sandy, however, wiped out miles of Verizon's copper network. The affected telegraph customers are reportedly fine with moving to modern fiber-based services. Yet Verizon is still required by the Federal Communications Commission to ask for the agency's permission to discontinue its tele telegraph offering, a service that is literally obsolete. Another FCC regulation requires telephone companies to label, track, and report the exact location down to the specific room and shelf of every single piece of equipment in their central offices, even a $10 circuit board. And if that $10 circuit board lasts two decades, the company has to keep a record of it in all of its movements for those 20 years, along with records on every other piece of equipment throughout their network. Now, thankfully, Mark Zuckerberg's dorm room wasn't burdened by such government micromanagement. Unnecessary laws like these at the FCC and throughout the U.S. Code have piled up over the decades. And while you talk about these things, and it may sound trivial, their accumulated burdens represent a significant economic drag that diverts limited resources to lawyers and regulators and away from providing new products and services to consumers. Second, Congress needs to modernize those laws that we don't get rid of so that our statutes better reflect the 21st century. As you can imagine, there are several statutory regimes that are in need of modernization. As a ranking member of the Senate Com Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, I expect that we're going to revisit some of those laws governing subscription services this year. Many of these laws were written before streaming video, before cloud DVRs, but even before satellite TV became widespread. This is an area of communication law that is certainly ripe for an update. The Commerce Committee has also done work on cybersecurity. After fits and starts, I'm pleased our committee has advanced bipartisan legislation that resists a top-down regulatory approach. And I'm hopeful that this year may be the one when such legislation, which is supported, I might add, by the tech community, is finally enacted. Two other high-profile issues that I often hear from the technology and communication sectors are electronic surveillance and immigration. As you all know, there's currently a robust public debate over how to appropriately balance security and privacy in the digital world. Getting this balance right is a critical challenge facing policymakers all around the world, and I expect congressional attention on this important matter in the months ahead. On immigration, the Senate passed a bill that had some problems associated with it last year, but nonetheless it included some very worthwhile provisions, particularly on high-skilled immigration. I'm a co-sponsor of targeted legislation that would increase the number of high-skilled workers who can come to work in this country, and I was glad to see that the Senate bill included meaningful provisions to ensure that the United States will continue to be a magnet for the best and the brightest talents from around the world. There's a fair amount of consensus around these provisions, and I wish that more of my colleagues would welcome such victories where they can be found, rather than insisting on an all-or-nothing approach to legislating. Third, the government should work to protect the Internet from threats from abroad. This is an area where I do believe the U.S. government can and should play an active role in protecting the Internet. Many of you are familiar with overseas efforts to increase governmental control of the Internet, particularly with the International Telecommunications Union and Agency of the United Nations. In 2012, the United States government supported a bipartisan consensus in Congress, I should say supported by a bipartisan consensus in Congress, sent a delegation to Dubai that successfully beat back proposals to have the ITU regulate the Internet. The victory, however, was a narrow one. There is still a great deal of diplomatic work that needs to be done to convince other countries that a light touch, multi-stakeholder governance model is what is best for them and their citizens and for the Internet itself. Keeping open the avenues for digital trade around the world is another area where the United States government needs to focus its efforts. I've introduced the Bipartisan Digital Trade Act with my Democratic colleague, Senator Ron Wyden, which would make digital trade a top negotiating priority for American diplomats in future trade deals. Countries like China and Brazil, and for that matter, even our friends in Europe, are increasingly considering policies to block, frustrate, and disfavor American digital services and goods. 
just as we have long fought against protectionist barriers that harm American manufacturing and exports, we now need to ensure that digital protectionism doesn't lead to the balkanization of the Internet. We risk segregating parts of the world from the global network of networks and creating second-class netizens who might not fully benefit from the power of the Internet. And we must avoid letting the legitimate privacy concerns in the debate over electronic surveillance become a stocking horse for opportunistic restrictions on digital trade. By working toward these three goals, eliminating unnecessary laws, modernizing the necessary ones, and protecting the Internet from international threats, Congress can help create an environment that allows people to innovate freely. A legal environment where entrepreneurs can concentrate on end users and technology rather than on bureaucrats and government restrictions. Policymakers and the private sector alike, however, need to stay focused on making sure that all segments of our population can enjoy the fruits of the digital revolution, old and young, rich and poor, urban and rural. And while there's much the government can do, particularly with proper stewardship of the Universal Service Program, I challenge the private sector to spend more time thinking about the digital divide. Not every technology user is a young person with a good job living in a big city on the coast. I was sharing with Roger earlier today, my dad is 94 years old. He still lives in my hometown of Myrtle, South Dakota, population 500. And the internet is his window to the world. I get emails from him. I asked him once to Google himself, and he did. Believe it or not, he played basketball for the University of Minnesota back in the 1940s. And there's actually, under the images section, of his Google website, there's a photo of him uh, in the shower. <laughs> for, for, fortunately, from the waist up, something you probably wouldn't see today. It was from a Minneapolis uh, newspaper at the time. But, but it's an example, again, of just how much information is available to people, even like my father, who's 94 years old. And uh, that is what keeps him connected and keeps him going every single day. For, mo for many folks, however, the Internet is a foreign language, and cutting-edge technology is financially out of reach. And it's the government alone cannot bridge uh, this digital divide. And that's why I encourage all the smart people out there, the people in this room, the people in Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, and the Silicon Prairie, to really think about the unique digital literacy and adoption challenges facing older Americans, consumers in rural communities, minority populations, and others for whom the promise of the Internet remains unfulfilled. The private sector is far better than the government at making the Internet relevant to the public. After all, it is the great apps, the gee whiz devices, the invaluable online services, and even the quirky forms of entertainment that truly drive Internet adoption. As a representative of a state with many rural and tribal communities, I'm committed to working on this issue, and I want to call on you in the private sector to be similarly committed to that cause. From my position on the Commerce Committee and in Republican leadership, I see every day the rewards and challenges of living through the digital revolution. The world moves so fast that it is hard for even the most technologically savvy and digitally connected person to keep up with everything. everything. So it should be no surprise that our laws have fallen woefully behind. Many of the policies affecting our digital life were written in a world that is unrecognizable to today's digital natives and are just as outdated as the dial-up modem. So I'm going to work with my colleagues in the Senate to start a dialogue on modernizing America's digital policies because we need 21st century laws for a 21st century world. Consumers easily and routinely discard old technologies like pagers and floppy disks for newer and better technologies. The government needs to be willing to do the same with America's antiquated laws. Thank you very much. You all have a great conference. Thanks, Roger.